also try to echo my uh, my colleagues acknowledgement of being invited here to such a prestigious center. It is my pride and honor to be with you today and to share some humble thoughts about one of the longest moments <coughs> of our history. Up before ten years, I used to be the rebellious academic. The sky was the limit for me. But during the last 10 years, as an ambassador to the United Kingdom, I started switching a little bit to create a balance in my mindset. How to synchronize objectivity with the mindset of being a diplomat, trying to follow certain policies, which is so agonizing that I sometimes cannot reconcile with myself. So it is a tough job to exonerate yourself wearing the hat of an academic one day and the hat of a diplomat. So what I will try today is the fact that I will not be a true diplomat, but I will be a sharp critic of, of an academic who has been constantly writing on this conflict for the last 30 years. I would like to certain premises. Since Eddie has always emphasized theory in all his presentations, he talks about structures, he talks about axioms, he talks about how to move in terms of thinking rationally to coming into solutions. I will become more a practitioner. A practitioner that tests these methodologies and see whether they work or not. One basic conclusion I have is there is nothing called conflict resolution. Let's not get ourselves. It's a novice discipline that will take years and years to achieve because we don't have the magic one in social sciences to say that conflict resolution is the only way out of any conflict. No. We started establishing new axiomatic presentations on this issue by saying that yes, there is something called crisis management. And crisis management is completely different than conflict resolution. Crisis management is you trying to minimize the losses in any kind of negotiated settlement. So crisis management maybe is a tracking towards not only making peace, but signing a piece of paper. I remember, you know, just a couple of years ago before the passing away of one of the most distinguished journalists in the United Kingdom uh, by the name of, uh, I forgot his name, it will come to me, and uh, uh, Frost, Sir David Frost. He invited me five times on this show, and this is unconventional. 55 million watches this program live. So I was on it five times. I told him, Sir David, you know what prompts you to bring me? He says, every time you come, you give me a new idea. And he asked me since last time, what was any draconian changes on the political scene in Palestine and Israel after the last interview six months ago? And I just came up with one tagline, just don't go me spiritually. And I said, Sir David, today Palestinians continue to be stuck with the historical negativity and the political impossibility. He looked at me and he was baffled. He said, can you repeat that? And I repeated it. He said, ladies and gentlemen, the ambassador said to me, we are stuck between the historical inevitable and the political impossible. Now, we believe that any conflict should have certain limitations for its continuation. And we have all these two factors in that it's not the bilateral or the internal conditions that exacerbates the cycle and the spiral of violence as much as also there are external factors that play a pivotal role in shaping and molding that kind of a conflict. I don't need basically to remind you how many times the Palestinian-Israeli conflict or the Arab-Israeli conflict 
was the cause behind the First World War. Many situations happened in the past where our conflict, you know, uh, almost created a new kind of an objective condition where it could have led to another major war in the world. From my personal experience <coughs> as a practitioner, the second practical lesson, I learned two lessons. I learned two lessons. One, incrementalism is a recipe for disaster. And the second lesson I learned is unilateralism is another recipe for disaster. And I can prove incrementalism and unilateralism were both recipes of disaster by using Gaza on one side and the Mosul agreement withdrawal incremented from the occupied territories as another recipe for disaster. Now, let's not kid ourselves. It's not only the six processes that we uh, uh, listen to today by Professor Kaufman, but there are 70 processes. For the last almost 70 years, we have been engaged in trying to reconcile substance with process. And our major difficulty has always been the process and not the substance. Because everybody knows what the ultimate result is going to be. There is nothing short than a two-state solution with 22% of historic Palestine from the Palestinians. Everybody knows that this is the only solution given the current socio-economic <coughs> objective conditions of this conflict. So we know what the end result is, and we have to prepare ourselves how to reach to that end, and by reaching that end, we have to make an optimize what we call painful historic compromises. And the painful historic compromises are made to accept the general idea that we are two nations that could coexist because we have no other choice. This is a small piece of that. It's not even as big as present day Armenia, which is only one tenth of historic Armenia. So we have two peoples living there with two different nationalisms, with two different religions, try to reconcile what we say to share the land. The problem, as I said, has always been with the process and not with the substance. Because the substance has been defined. The substance are basically six, what we call six permanent status issues. Meaning settlements, Jerusalem, water, security, the refugee problems, and what have The enigma of peace in the Middle East lies in the fact, what is the borders of Israel? If can Israel define its borders, then we have strategies of how to deal with it strategically and tactfully and to reach an agreement in something that we have invented in the year 2000 at the Oregon House, the concept of transfer. But you tell me, where is the starting point? Is it the status quo, occupation plus autonomy? Is it occupation plus, is it autonomy minus statehood? Give me something that I could rely in the discipline of political science to understand the definition of a state that you are more or less formulating to the Palestinians. I think Israel has failed to take a bold stand in defining its borders. Now that alone, that we have hundreds of UN uh, resolutions, whether in the Security Council or whether in the General Assembly, most of them were not binding for the state of Israel. Why? Why it was not binding for the state of Israel, especially the last 20 years? For the simple fact that the international system has went through dramatic changes from a balance of power to a unipolar power. And that unipolar power is the United States of America. Nobody can really convince us that the United States of America has been acting for the last 22 years as an honest broker of peace. I have my doubts. I have my doubts because I have evidence to prove to you that it was not an honest broker of peace. The United States of America only played a pivotal role in crisis management. 
and not in conflict resolution. And that's why its role has been diminished to insignificance for the simple fact that the constant military incursions continued with the occupation and the constant wars that we are witnessing in the occupied territories are merely a combination of the failure or, or the dismal failure of what we call U.S. policy. <coughs> we have to understand that we are part and parcel also of our politics. We cannot erase the fact that we Palestinians as non-state actors when we were within the PAO and uh, using armed struggle as a way to achieve our national aspirations, we have been a non-state actors influential in regional politics. Now we have dramatically shifted from being non-state actors on struggle into something called actors with state structures and ministries and taking as a strategy non-violence, non-military solution and adopting the strategy of negotiations in order to achieve our ends. This has take, took 25 years of the PLO to change its mindset and to understand that pragmatism, which is choosing between constraints, is the ultimate strategy for us to achieve our self-determination. We did not continue with the idea of revolution and violence, but we came to understand that the political reality imposes upon ourselves to play the political and the diplomatic game rather than the military game. And that's why our President Mahmoud Abbas, since he came to power, he has taken non-violence as a strategy of his government and of his policy. Because he knows if we want to play the game of military might, we are falling in the trap of Israel because Israel wants that game. That's the only way to perpetuate conflict and to continue with occupation. If President Arafat was a threat as far as violence, as they claim, and security, although he was you know, the maestro of convincing all the PLO factions to come to understand political accommodation is the recipe in order to find our national aspirations, President Abbas went the nine yards, as we say. He adopted this strategy and, and wore the hat of the diplomat and the politician, and he never looked back at the question of military to solve our conflicts. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to make clear distinctions between peacemaking and peacebuilding. It is so nice to talk about initiatives, but we have failed at, as peoples to reconcile our differences and to understand that the basic fact is we cannot continue to be at poggerheads trying to engage each other in a process of demonization, in the process of war of images, in the process of finger pointing and blaming one side against the other. One motto should be the strategy for both sides. How can we cooperate, Eddie and I, to end occupation? Occupation is the essence of this conflict, and the rest is real academic. Once we try more or less to reach that stage of accepting that occupation cannot continue, then Palestinians and Israelis are ingenious enough to find solutions to all our current problems, including the question of Jerusalem and the right of return to the refugees. But in order to change that mindset, we need to have what we call psychological therapy. And I tell you, Israelis and Palestinians, they need psychological therapies because we are totally out of it now. Of course, the Israelis can afford psychological therapists, the Palestinians cannot afford it. So there is an imbalance there. We hope that they can have the therapists, maybe they can help us in trying more or less in overcoming our problems. That's why I think peace building between nations, especially when we claim to be two democratic entities, side by side, and no one can deny the fact that the Palestinian society is a democratic society. It's a pluralist society. Listen, I'm Armenian, Christian, Catholic. I'm the ambassador of Palestine in the United Kingdom, the second most important in world politics after Washington. 
So nobody can tell me that, you know, we are not an ethnically diversified pluralist kind of society that believes in democracy. And I challenge the audience to tell me the two elections that we run are the most important elections, the most honest elections with no risks whatsoever were the Palestinian legislative elections. So we are a democratic entity. And we believe in history that democracies don't fight each other, although they beg to differ with each other. So if we have the components of a democratic entity, I don't start with this here, what is left for us to come and sit down at the negotiating table and in a civilized way try to find solutions for our own? I think the question is psychological, it is a mindset. If we try to exonerate ourselves from all the stereotypes and demonization process, from the, from the obsession of security, which I always define in mathematics 10 over 0 undefined, because every time when you say something, Israel says security, security, security. Security is becoming the magic word for Israel to exonerate itself from the responsibilities of how to deal with the occupation. So here comes the real challenge for intellectuals, academics, and politicians. Can we perpetuate the status quo of occupation? No. Because the steadfastness of the Palestinian, five million people are saying no to occupation. We are going to stay in our country until we find a solution. So, so unless Israel wants to commit another genocide like the Armenian genocide. And I don't think Israel, with its Judaism, has that concept of killing Palestinians massively in a genocide. So this option is out of the way. But today, the facts on the ground are changing dramatically. We talk about the two-state solution. The last 22 years, settlements have tripled, settlers have tripled, the West Bank has been divided into four cantons, the Gaza is totally isolated, Jerusalem is totally isolated, there is no geographic contiguity, and then we talk about the two-state solution. How can we convince the people on the ground who are separated by 600 military checkpoints in the West Bank to tell them, yes, we have the chance of having an economically vibrant geographic entity called Palestine. So we cannot fool our people by this concept of a two-state solution when we see the demography and the geography is dramatically changing on the ground. And that's why we need to be bold enough. To stick to our guns, we have to do something about removing checkpoints, removing the wall, talking about security, trying to bring the Palestinian geographic entity together to give hope in terms of progress and development. This is what I call coin the uh, confidence building measures, as the Americans say, CBMs. We neglected the CBMs, but we exacerbated the violence by imposing these new facts on the grounds, which would make it impossible to go along with the two state solution. There is no third way. What is the other option? Now, in a two-state solution, I totally agree with Eddie with everything he has said about the Geneva Initiative, about the kingdom parameters, uh, you know, about you know uh, uh, the Arab Peace Initiative, you know, which I would like just to talk a little bit about it because it's a very important document. The only other option left for us is a one-state solution. And one state solution meaning binational state. And binational state means one vote, one man, one vote. And I try to be not against the gender, one woman, one vote. Okay? So that in itself creates a big problem to Israel. And to the political discourse in Israel. If they accept the one state solution, it means that the demographic imbalance 10 years or 30 years from now is going to house the concept of the Jewish nation, the Jewish state, and there goes the Zionist messianic dreams of the Red Sister. It cannot be accepted. And I always say, which makes my audiences laugh in the United Kingdom, when I say if Israel has the nuclear power, we have the democratic power. And it's easy to deal with the nuclear rather than with the demographic, because that demographic power is a total threat to the state of Israel. So if Israel understands this reality, what does it take Israel to accept the two-state solution? And have the state over 78% of historic Palestine, 
And this was given to them on a golden platter by the Arab peace initiative by His Majesty the King of Saudi Arabia when he came with this ingenious plan in 2002, which was adopted in the Arab summit of Beirut. And our distinguished Shahjid Affair was there in Lebanon. He was telling me when this draft was, was, uh, was drafted, the resolution was drafted. What does the Arab Peace Initiative say? It gives the safety valve for the existence of Israel to stay on the land, to be part and parcel of the region, to integrate into a region as a full-fledged nation state with food security and total normalization, diplomatically with trade relations. And I always say, I wish the Israelis accepted the 2002 Saudi Initiative. Today, believe me today, we could have seen, we could have seen the flags of Israel poisoned in Mecca and in Tehran. Because it's not only the Arabs that accepted the peace initiative, and, and, and His Excellency could tell me, but 59 Islamic states had accepted the Arab peace initiative. And we were always told by Arab that Arabs don't lose an opportunity, lose an opportunity. I tell the Israelis, if you are the masters of that, you are not preaching the converted anymore. I think you have to draw the lesson that this is a chance of a lifetime. And what I feel from the Arab League, that this issue is not going to stay on the table. In other words, if this is today an offer, tomorrow it's not going to be offered to Israel. Then we go back to the zero-sum conflict. And I say this is the golden opportunity to have a president like Mahmoud Abbas, who is so pragmatic, to have the Arab Peace Initiative, to have the big Arab countries in Saudi Arabia, pushing for a peace process, pushing for negotiations, and Israel to continue with its belligerency of building settlements and creating facts on the ground and trying to create, exacerbate the conflict through naked aggression is a recipe for disaster. I think Israel today is responsible for the security of its own citizens. It's not the Palestinians who are responsible. And we need security as the occupied much more than the occupied. So the security of Israel is the security of the Palestinians. And I look at it from that perspective because it takes two to tango, as we always say. I was one of those who said, let the president throw the keys to the occupation. But I was coined after seven, eight years. And the reason why I said that at that time is the fact I have seen the pitfalls of the Oslo Agreement. And I said, we don't need charity from the international community. And I don't want Europe to be a player rather than a player in the political process. And you cannot pay money to help the Palestinians, which is the responsibility of the occupier and not the international community to feed the occupier and to relieve it from paying its dues in occupying the land. <coughs> so this has been a dramatic point that perpetuated occupation because Israel has one of the least expensive occupations in the world. Europe, United States, the Arab countries are paying for the perpetuation of occupation. I always say the solution should be a political solution. And our problem with Israel is not an economic problem. Our problem does not need a humanitarian solution. Our problem is a political problem that needs a need political solution. A political solution that ends occupation and open avenues of cooperation between Palestine and Israel as two democratic entities. I would say And by quoting, as I quoted Antonio Gramsci, one of my idol philosophers, who, from whom I have derived my strategy in life and how to pursue my life in the context of conflict. If I will always think as an academic and look at the facts and say one plus one equals two and it's not three, Unless in Zen Buddhism it is free. I say the pessimism of the intellect is a good example to diagnose the problem 
but the solution lies in the optimism of the good will. Because if we give up our optimism in finding a solution, I think conflict will continue forever. And as I said, unipolarism, unilateralism, occupation, peace, security, justice are keys that should be dealt with with careful, with precision, because without considering and factoring the human dimension in this conflict and the waste of life in this conflict, I think it will be impossible for us to reach a solution. Thank you very much, Mr. Adams.